Good Wednesday afternoon to you. Four o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Thanks for joining us. Roster building season continues for the Browns and Andrew Berry out in Berea. Jameis Winston, backup quarterback that the Browns uh, agreed to terms with in town to sign his contract, has a message for Browns fans. Public service announcement, dog pound. What's up? It's your new quarterback, Jameis Winston, coming here to help lead and support and help get us some victories. All right, you know we're here. We're live and local. We know you love us. I can't wait to see you soon. I can't wait to re really get in this building, get to work with Deshaun, get to work with, with David. Like, it's going to be unbelievable. Thank you for the support always. I look forward to meeting all y'all soon. Training camp 2024 coming real soon. Thank you. So Winston agreed to a one-year contract worth $4 million, another 4.7 potential in incentives, according to league sources. Uh, Winston also talks about the process that brought him in, uh, made him decide he wanted to become a Cleveland Brown. There wasn't any conversation uh, with me and Deshaun prior uh, to signing, but there has been conversation with, with me and Deshaun uh, since the signing and, uh, and 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 during the free agency process, I mean, you 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 talk to certain teams, you develop relationships. Uh, typically, during the tampering period, uh, two days before uh, the new the new league year. So uh, my agent, I have an incredible agent who was on top of the relationship and, and feedback uh, with the Cleveland Browns uh, since the uh, the combine uh, time. So uh, I'm thankful that I have people that are expertise at what they do. Uh, to, to, to speak on my behalf, that I'm able to communicate and know me well enough to be able to to share that same vision with whoever wanted to pursue me. Uh, but like I said, like this opportunity really stood out because of one, uh, the great organization that it is, uh, two, the incredible fan base and incredible people that uh, that this city possesses. And, uh, and three, just the opportunity to, uh, to remain grateful and, and to build and influence others around me. With that, let's welcome in Fred Greetham, senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Fred, um, fan base wanted Joe Flacco back. Uh, Winston's about 10 years younger. Generally regarded as one of the best backups in the NFL. Yeah, um, Dave, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm kind of, we talked to him uh, about an hour ago, and I had heard some things over the weekend um, about him that, I was pleasantly happy to hear and I'm kind of warming up to him. Um, I haven't followed his career as closely as maybe he would because he has been in the NFC. Um, obviously number one overall pick. He's definitely grown up. He talked about that today and at 30 years old, married, has two kids and you know, I had just pretty much heard a lot of the early years, you know, immaturities and so forth. And actually came away impressed. When you when you take the emotion out of it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I was a proponent of bringing Flacco back. Kind of, if, it, if it's not broke, why fix it? But I do see why they did what they did. As you mentioned, you got nine, ten years um, lesser age. And you have a guy that, that really could probably step in and play and do what you want. I put out a six step for the Browns to get back to the playoffs, and the first five were all about starting positions that I felt they needed to address. But I threw in the sixth as a veteran backup quarterback, and this was because we saw what happened last year. And I was, I had Flacco as my number one choice. I had Brissett as the number two choice, but I did have Jameis Winston on the list. But to be honest, I thought he was maybe a starting or a higher caliber than what the Browns were looking for. But I'm very pleased that they got a veteran backup. In fact, they didn't get one. They got two by getting Tyler Huntley. So they almost went overboard you know, to correct the problem. And I mean, one thing it's telling me is that Andrew Barry, they learn from their mistake, but you have to look at the four quarterbacks now and feel a lot better about this room than you did last year with the four. At this time last year, when they went to training camp, it was Deshaun Watson, Dorian Thompson, Robinson, Josh Dobbs and Kellen Mond. Now you have 
Tyler Huntley, who did make the Pro Bowl, um, Jamison Winston, former number one pick overall, and Dorian Thompson Robinson, as well as Watson. And I really, people say, well, they got too many. I fully expect this to happen. They traded Josh Dobbs at the end of training camp when they felt good that DTR was ready. He obviously wasn't. And I see them moving on and being able to recoup a draft pick, you know, for a team that suffers an injury or so forth. There's no way they're going to keep four quarterbacks. But I I see that as an investment because we've seen what Andrew Berry's done turning a fifth or sixth round pick into Jerry Judy or Amari Cooper. And so they're really valuable to them down the road. So I see this as more an investment than not having confidence in Deshaun Watson, you know, or Jamison Winston or whatever. Um, Browns also made some news uh, within the last half hour. So they're, um, they've agreed to terms with Dante Foreman, uh, running back. Five touchdowns in nine games last year for the Bears. Also had a, a 900-yard season um, in his past. Um, I like this. Uh, Fred, I don't know how you feel about this. We had not had a chance to talk about it. I, I like the signing of Foreman quite a bit. Well, yeah. Just as just a few minutes ago, I was catching up with that on our site and writing story about it. Um, at this time of the year, things pop up. When I was talking about those six steps, uh, number four was add a veteran running back, and they did not. Other Naeem Hines was more of a return guy. I don't or a, a back out of the backfield. I didn't see him as a running back per se between the tackles more a guy in the Kareem Hunt role because we don't know the status of Nick Chubb. I took it that they didn't go aggressively at some of the bigger name guys that they felt good about where Nick Chubb was, and they would probably draft a running back, as Andrew Berry has done on the third day, you know, with a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round pick. The signing of Foreman today I did a free agency reset, and he was second on my list behind J.K. Dobbins. So I am pleased that they they got a veteran running back because really it is an unknown with Nick Chubb, and you really can't go into the season, in my opinion, without somebody other than Jerome Ford who's been there and done that. This guy can really fill that role that I think Kareem Hunt did and he can he's he's motivated probably a one year deal uh to show the league what he can do so if chubb isn't ready to start the season you have you have you know a veteran like foreman you know to play so again i expect moves like this everybody's getting freaked out that they didn't go out and get big name guys in free agency they're going to fill in the roster like they did last year i'll remind you that Darius smith didn't come till late in about the draft and Shelby Harris didn't sign till training camp. They already got both those guys done. So I see these one year signings from veterans to fill holes for a team that can win now. And I, I even would see that at wide receiver, to be honest. All right. So uh, you alluded to this one a little bit earlier. They made the signing of Tyler Huntley official one year deal veteran minimum does get some incentives. Um, Again, this is a guy that has started um, in place of Lamar Jackson and (laughs) Browns fans only have to look back a couple of years. He looked pretty good against the Browns um, starting for Jackson a couple of years ago. So again, veteran guy and, and showed he can play in the NFL. Yeah, he did. I mean, he he regressed a little statistically. He didn't play last year, but, you know, I was kind of surprised in a quarterback-hungry league that somebody didn't go after him. I don't know why the Colts wouldn't have went after him to, to go with Anthony Richardson as opposed, no disrespect to Joe Flacco, but Huntley's more in the role, you know, like a Lamar Jackson or uh, – Anthony Richardson. So I was a little surprised by the signing, but then when you see it's a it's a basically a one year veteran minimum type deal, I don't see a lot of risk there. And again, 
I think the Browns are looking at it as an investment because if he looks good in the preseason, you know, or Winston, one or the other, they could trade and pick up some some commodity for him. And I think that's how you have to look at this. It's not a big dollar and cents commitment. We know they're not going to keep all four. And maybe if Huntley really looks good, he's young enough that they keep him and move on from Dorian Thompson Robertson. I don't think that'll happen, but I think that they want to not be caught, you know, kind of short like they were last year. It really cost them last year. They were lucky to be honest that Flacco bailed them out. You know, he wasn't on their radar or anybody else's radar. They'd have brought him in long before November 20th. All right, before we go to break, I know you wrote a, an article about Jerry Judy, high expectations, and Judy feels his ceiling's pretty high. Take us through that and, and just kind of your thoughts um, on what Jerry Judy, um, what he could be for the Browns. Well, you know, I, I think this was a signing of potential or trade. I said that uh, Andrew Barry would make a trade for a veteran. I had him third as an option. Um, so I'll take credit at least for that. I did have two guys ahead of him that I felt I wanted a little more proven commodity that, you know, kind of maybe being greedy, the Amari Cooper type that had already been a pro bowler or been a thousand yard guy. But Jerry Judy, they signed him to the extension. So they really are putting their their money where their mouth is. And they expect him, obviously, with the money they committed to be a big player here. So. Yeah, I think that, you know, he's a little further along than Elijah Moore. He's done a little more than Elijah Moore, but it's in that vein. And it's also similar to the Mari Cooper that they only gave up a fifth and sixth round pick. And it was really about the money. And they found a way to make that work financially and committed to him. So this is a guy Andrew Berry's like for a long time. So he said he has a high ceiling and the Browns obviously believe that as well. Fred Greetham, senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Now I'm going to step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, we'll hear more from Jameis Winston about his relationship with Deshaun Watson. Plus, Jordan Hicks, what can we expect from him joining Jim Schwartz's defense again? Sports for CLA, be right back. Stay with us. Here comes the rush. All right, everybody, let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery. Like the $10 Lady Luck 50X. It's got prizes all the way up to 500 grand, so you could really clean up. The Lady Luck family of scratch-offs is the Ohio Lottery's first ever, with five price points from $1 to 20. They're an easy way to cook up some fun. We continue talking Browns with Fred Greetham, senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Jameis Winston met with the media today, was asked about his relationship with Deshaun Watson, the Browns cornerback. Uh, another example of how the Browns are trying to do everything they can uh, to support Deshaun Watson. I passed uh, first first cross um, back in 2014 when we played, played Clemson. And, uh, and just from his success, uh, on then, I've always uh, encouraged him, uh, shot him uh, Instagram messages every now and then about me being proud of him and, and continuing to persevere. Uh, and uh, and we just kind of kind of just stayed in contact in that way. Um, the biggest thing about uh, this relationship is like when not only is this going to be a, a credible relationship because me and him have both had a lot of success throughout our football career. But it's going to be a relatable uh, experience with us both being uh, African American quarterbacks out of the deep South, right? So I've experienced some of the cer certain things that he's experienced throughout his career, uh, which which allows him to be able to depend on me uh, or, or to lean on me uh, to, to to different specific avenues that he might want to pursue or uh, any questions that he might have. But uh, one of the biggest things uh, that I'm, I'm I'm bringing to Deshaun is just just really support. And encouragement because he he has achieved so much and, and that's why he is this this organization's franchise quarterback. Uh, but but as a lot of us a lot of us know, like we all make this ship go. 
And Fred, when you look at it, the job of an organization is to do everything they can to maximize their quarterback. The quarterback's that important. So, yeah, the Browns are trying to make Deshaun Watson feel comfortable, and they're going to tweak the offense to his skill set, and they should. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about the backup quarterback because everybody saw what Joe Flacco did and, you know, a lot wanted him back. Um, but but the fact of the matter is, if number four, Deshaun Watson, doesn't play well, the Browns are not going to be able to achieve what they've set out to do. And I think we saw, you know, and, and I give a lot of credit to what Flacco did, but I do think that the system was in place for for him to step in and flourish. And maybe the system is in place for a guy like Jameis Winston, who obviously has all the skills to step in and flourish if need be as well. And so I just think in the support, like I said, I was very impressed with hearing him talk today. And um, he, you know, what I had heard from him in the past, not, being as closely connected, he seems like a very mature young man that has grown up in the recent, and he said as much in the last several years, and he said his whole job is to support Deshaun Watson and be there if called upon, and that's what you want to hear from your backup, and you want a guy that could step in, like Flacco did, and win some games for you if need be. But, I mean, no question – if Deshaun Watson is injured and out for the season like he was last year, the Browns are going to have a tough time, you know, whoever, whoever, whatever backup quarterback plays. to They might make the playoffs, but to, to go all the way to the Super Bowl, it's very few and far between. So the Browns realize that, and this their path forward is with Deshaun Watson. If he, has a, if he plays the whole year and is a disaster – well, then they're going to have to make a decision, move on for the future, and maybe Winston or Huntley could be a part of that. Who knows? All right, let's uh, switch sides of the ball. Let's talk a little bit about the defense. <clears throat> I know you wrote an article for the Orange and Brown Report about um, Hicks rejoining Jim Schwartz um, and kind of feeling like the defense can be special. Take us through that article, what you found out. Well, Zadarius Smith said kind of the same thing, one of the reasons he resigned. But Jordan Hicks, yeah, he alluded to that. He played with Jim Schwartz in Philadelphia when they won the Super Bowl. He was injured when they won the Super Bowl, so he didn't play in that in the playoff game. But he talked about, you know, just knows what he can do and knows this defense. This is the second year of this defense. So there are expectations, expectations that it should even be better. Hicks has had over 100 tackles five straight years. I think they view him as a leader, as Anthony Walker was, and a guy that will step in and fill that role. And not only a leader on the defense, but also maybe an upgrade as a tackler. Like I said, having over 100 tackles, five straight years. Walker's finished the last two years on injury reserve. And so I feel like they feel like they brought back all their starters in re-signing nine of the 11 starters on defense. Hicks is one that replaces one of those starters, Anthony Walker. And the other one is Sion Taki Taki. Um, they did sign Devin Bush, whether he's going to end up being the starter, you know, there. The linebacking position, for the most part, I think Jim Schwartz likes to play two, and JOK is the other one. And so now you have kind of the second one in Jordan Hicks. Again, I'd be surprised if they didn't bring in another one-year veteran guy to, to supplement what they have with Hicks and Devin Bush. So, yeah, I think that Hicks was attracted here, and I think that like Rodney McLeod, kind of a coach on the field in Jim Schwartz's defense. So you look at it, and, and you know, they bring back Hurst. They bring back Shelby Harris. You do bring Quinton Jefferson. You lose Jordan Elliott. You do bring back Zadarius Smith. Um, you add the linebackers that we talked about. 
Is there a little bit of an upgrade, do you think, in the defense just by bringing in Quinton Jefferson for Elliott and by getting a Jordan Hicks instead of Sione Takitaki? Yeah, I don't. I think just by keeping the team intact, by bringing back Zadarius Smith, to me, he was the biggest priority on their own free agents. The other ones, you know, I felt were replaceable. Jordan Elliott has been here four years, and I cannot remember more in a couple of plays he's made. Now, that's not disparaging him, but Quentin Jefferson had six sacks last year at defensive tackle for the Jets. That would have been second on the Browns. Their second leading sack man had five and a half. And so he would have been second behind Miles Garrett. So I think that gives them pass rush from the inside. That's clearly an upgrade. And I felt Shelby Harris and Maurice Hurst were the two best defensive tackles they had right with the Dalvin Tomlinson, if not uh, as good as Tomlinson, right behind him as second and third. And so Quentin Jefferson's one of those type guys you have lined up. And so they've upgraded there. Everybody else was brought back. And I do think that Hicks is an upgrade over Anthony Walker or Sion Taki Taki, wherever he's used. And I don't think they're done. I think they will fortify with some more veteran help. But you brought back healthy now everybody that started last year, but the two defensive, the linebackers. And I feel they... They have upgraded at least one of them so far, and I think they will be able to re find a replacement. Maybe they already have, if not, upgrade it. Fred Greetham, senior analyst from the Orange and Brown Report. Now I'm going to step aside, take one more time out. Uh, other side of the break, we'll take a look at uh, what Andrew Barry has turned some day three picks into. Sports for CLA, be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns with Fred Greetham, senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Jameis Winston and just, you know, how he has matured and grown up. Winston, in his time with the Saints, uh, has been viewed as a great locker room guy and a really good teammate. When you are who you are every single day, uh, it's, it's, it's easy uh, to be that same person every single day. And I think a lot of people, they love people that are genuine. They, they love people uh, that are, are of, of increase and optimistic. So uh, I, I try to make sure that I'm focused, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on that space. I'm focused on uh, how we can get better and how we can get better together. So uh, I'm, I'm always looking for ways to uh, enhance those around me because I, I, I know that that is what a, a leader encompasses. Fred, we've, we've talked a little bit about it and, and um, how he seems to have matured. He went back and looked, and he really credits Drew Brees with helping him out personally and professionally. Yeah, and there's another guy that was here, too, Demario Davis, who's a, a big leader down there and speaks very highly of Jamison. Um, I was talking to a, 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 somebody close to the team, and he helps out kind of not, not in the organization, but he helps out in, oh, just – players off the field, counseling, tough stuff like that. And he said that DeMario Davis recommended this individual to him, and he called him already before he even came to Cleveland. And and this individual was pretty impressed already with what he's heard of him. So I think that in just a little bit what I picked up from him today, I think he's going to really be a good influence in the locker room. And I think that um, that will be something that will be strong with Deshaun Watson and, you know, just just all the way around. I mean, it's most important that he can play, 
But as I said earlier, you kind of hope he never plays <laughs> unless he goes in to take a kneel. Because if he plays, that means there's something wrong with the quarterback, you know, as a player injury-wise or whatever. And I know there's a lot. We haven't seen enough of Watson, but – I'm confident if he stays on the field for 17 games, he's going to put up numbers, you know, better than what we have seen with the Browns quarterbacks in a long, long time. And so that's the biggest thing I've said all along. Number four has got to stay on the field. But I think Jameis Winston at least will be a great support, and hopefully he can step in and do as an effective job as Joe Flacco did you know, in his time here. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Watson has to play. It's been so, even last year was so fragmented. It, I don't think he got four games in a row. Um, and, and keep in mind, he, he's played 12 games. Browns are 8-4. and four. And I know quarterback uh, wins is not a quarterback stat, but winning is the most important thing that a quarterback can do. Um, take a look at this. These are day three. So typically day three picks aren't long-term starters, uh, let alone significant contributors. Um, with only fifth-round picks and later, Andrew Barry has acquired three years of Amari Cooper, three years of Zadarius Smith, three years of Dustin Hopkins, and four years of Jerry Judy. That's pretty good. That's, that is making the most of, um, of those picks. Well, you know, since the trade of Watson, obviously the Browns haven't been involved in the first round. Early in uh, Andrew Berry's tenure, his draft choices, you know, haven't blown people away. But what he has been done, doing well, in my opinion, is is making trades and acquiring proven talent okay, already proven. And, you know, you and I could be better talent evaluators if we are trading for guys that are already been to the pro bowl or really been good. And that's what he's embraced. The guys you put up on that were all acquired in a trade with those picks. So I would much rather rather. That's why I said now his top three wide receivers were all acquired in trades. Amari Cooper, as you alluded to Elijah Moore and Jerry Judy. That is the best way, rather than going into free agency and getting in a bidding war and overpaying for somebody, trade for the guy. You're giving up, what, a fifth, sixth, seventh round? Sure, because they have a big salary and they're trying to get rid of him. I mean, he gave up a second round for Elijah Moore, but he had a minimum rookie contract. And so... I just think that's the M.O. And he did the same thing with Zadarius Smith. And so that's why I said keep an eye on this Tyler Huntley. A lot of people thought that was strange and there was conspiracy that they were going to move on from Watson or or Winston was going to back out or this or that. Keep an eye that Andrew Berry will turn one of these quarterbacks into an asset for a future trade a fifth, sixth, seventh round with a team that might get desperate come training camp if they lose their quarterback for the season or whatever. So, yeah, I agree. He's been very good at using trades to bolster the roster. And don't put it past him to acquire somebody else, you know, here before the season starts, either through a trade or that one-year veteran free agent pickup. Who are some of the guys to listen out for for that as you move forward that you think could be one-year guys that you bring in that, that might be out there to fill out this? I mean, the 53-man roster, when you look at it, it it's pretty good, and, and there aren't a lot of holes. But as we found out last year, you can never – Injuries seem to come at position groups in the NFL. Who are some guys that you think would make sense on one-year deals to, to kind of round out the roster? Well, you know, it, it, it's fluent. It, you know, I had running back. I had J.K. Dobbins, you know, and Foreman. They got Foreman. Um, if they went for a – no, I don't know if they would look at an edge rusher or a defensive tackle. They've restocked pretty good, but there's guys out there like Calais Campbell or Tier Tart um, or a linebacker 
Zach Cunningham or Shaquille Leonard. Um, there's one year guys like Kyle Van Noy, you know, did pretty well with the Ravens. Uh, Derek Barnett, Mike Dana. There's a lot of these one year wonder guys out there. And then at wide receiver, you know, I had Mike Williams as my number one target before in just trading for him, kind of like they did Jerry Judy. I understand why they didn't, and now he's signed, so he's off the table. But there's there could be a guy like Mike Thomas, former Buckeye. Um, you know, you could get a guy like Tyler Boyd, depending on his market, DJ Chark. You know, these are guys that I don't think have signed yet, and their market will go way down. And you could get a fourth wide receiver for for nothing on a one year prove it deal, you know they may think they're already set, but I would like maybe somebody, you know, more competition in that room, you know, so you're you're still kind of thin. The only proven guy to me is is Amari Cooper, and if he goes down, then you're relying on more and Judy, and I would like somebody maybe. You know, maybe he's got a little tread in the tire, but he's done it in the past. Yeah, I'm with you. That that certainly makes sense. Um, and, and again, your your mo is make sure that Deshaun Watson has every opportunity to be as good um, as he can be. Fred Greetham, senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report, as always, great stuff. Thanks so much for the time and the insight. Appreciate it very much, Fred. Thanks for having me, Dave. Fred Greetham, make sure you check him out. Always really good stuff. Uh, he is the senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue talking Browns. Casey Kinneman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast straight ahead. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as academic all-stars and teachers of the month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K through 12. Is your K through 12 school developing students literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the school of the year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. Colin Cowherd has the uh, his top 10 teams post-free agency. This from The Herd with Colin Cowherd. Number seven, Cleveland. Uh, listen, the Deshaun Watson contract has some limitations. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of feel like they are what they are. They could maybe win a weaker division, but I just don't think, I don't think they'll be as good as Baltimore. I don't think they'll be, you know, I, I think because I don't know what Joe Burrow is going to look like. I'm going to put him in at number seven. I do think defensively, especially at home last year, they were special. They've added now uh, Jerry Judy, the wide receiver, along with Cooper. And I love Stefanski. So I'll put him at seven, but a bit of a mystery. With that, let's welcome in Casey Kinnaman, Dog Pound Daily, and the Barking Browns podcast. Um, I, I guess, yeah, the offense is still a mystery until we find out what – Deshaun Watson is going to be. Yeah, there were some backhanded compliments sandwiched <laughs> in there with Colin. Uh, but I think that just goes to show you how far this roster has come, the job that A.B. and Stefanski has done, and the respect that Stefanski gets as a head coach. That This is viewed as a top-10 team, even with the question mark at quarterback. You know, And, and if uh, Watson is able to raise his game, this thing could really take off. But I think it's viewed league-wide. This isn't just Colin. The, the Browns are an upper quartile team now just based on the strength of their overall roster. And uh, I don't know about that winning a, a weaker division. I mean, the Browns play in the toughest division <laughs> in all of the NFL, and I still think that they should be the favorites going into this season. Yeah, certainly one of them. You know, it's the team that interests me in the division the most. What are the Steelers going to look like if they get competent quarterback play? And, and now they got an either or. It could be Russell Wilson. It could be Justin Fields. Yeah, I – <laughs> I needed them to be in quarterback purgatory for so much longer. 
Yeah. And, but they fought through it. I just know that a month ago we felt better when they were like, hey, it's Mason Rudolph or Kenny Pickett. We're like, have at it. Yeah. And then neither of those are options now. So this is the world we live in. All right. Uh, this one uh, from PFF. One positive takeaway from all 32 NFL teams in free agency. Uh, for the Browns, they attacked their weakness. Two glaring weaknesses stood out for the Browns in 2023 a lack of receiving threats and poor run defense they've made a couple of shrewd moves um, to remedy those issues yet yeah, it you know what it's going to be interesting um, jerry judy he's intriguing he, again he wasn't was not on the top of my list i get what they like about him yeah he just gives you another dynamic body in that room a guy who can do more the guy who's you know he's you know got a little bit of size to him. He's he's a little slight, but he's definitely he's got the yards after the catch is what gets me. That's to me that's what he brings to the table. You know he's sudden, he's twitched up, but it's what he can give you after he catches the ball that you really did not have in that room. You had it with Njoku, but not in the wide receiver room. So now you got another guy that you can manufacture touches for, and he can really make it happen after he touches the ball. The uh, running game critique though, I don't really get that. Like. To me, if not, it's you lost Elliott and you replaced him with Jefferson. Jefferson's a much better pass rusher, but I would say he's a little less of a run defender. You did add Jordan Hicks, but that's really all you've done to bolster your running game as far as your defense goes. But at the end of the day, teams, you know, pass at your own risk. I think that that's what the Browns' approach is. You know, run it if you want, you know, but I think they would rather have to deal with that and then kind of just their strong suit is rushing the passer and getting after you in the back end. You know, and I still wouldn't call it a weakness, but it's not as good as their pass rush. I, I think that's the trade-off. You know, so I don't know if I'd even call those shrewd moves, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I think they've upgraded. I think Quentin Jefferson, and again, he's not going to play a – it's not like he's going to play mm -hmm. 700 snaps. Quentin Jefferson and um, Hicks. Yeah, I'm intrigued by Bush, too. I, I know he hasn't performed like the 10th pick in the draft, but let's see if – from what we're hearing, Jim Schwartz wanted him. If Jim Schwartz wanted him, there's he's got something in mind for him. Yeah, that's all I need to hear. If Jim Schwartz has a role in mind for you. Let's let's, let's let him cook. Let's just get out of his way and uh, give him the ingredients that he wants. Um, this is kind of interesting as well. This is from the Yard Barker. The hottest three hottest seats um, for the Cleveland Browns coming up. Number mm -hmm. one, they go to Sean Watson. That's it's pretty obvious. Twenty-eight year old um, has played just 12 games over the past two seasons, 14 touchdowns, nine interceptions. Watson will have zero excuses next season, especially after the addition of yet another uh, talented wide receiver, Jerry Judy. Elijah Moore, number 34 overall pick, 2021 draft, coming off yet another disappointing season in 2023, had just 640 yards receiving two touchdowns. Moore is headed into the final year of his rookie deal, means he must produce uh, his best season, or he will be heading elsewhere in 2025. And the aforementioned Devin Bush, number 10 overall pick, 2019 draft, hasn't been the same since his rookie year when he had 109 tackles, one sack, one forced fumble, four fumble recoveries, two interceptions. Most have chalked up his decline in play to him tearing his ACL in the 2020 season, but he's several years removed from that injury now. Um, the Watson thing, he's got to play better. But part of that is he's got to stay on the field. You know, the, the one year it was suspension. When a guy's hurt, it's a physical game. <laughs> yeah. And that only adds to the pressure that he's facing, you know, is that he has missed time now with, through the suspension and then with injury. So there is a pressure, a pressure to stay on the field and a pressure to lead this team. You know, and that probably just mounted even more when he was hurt last year and watched a uh, near-retired quarterback come in and, and, and do his thing and kind of lead him on a run towards the end. So that all adds to the pressure. And he, there's no built-in excuses. There's no, well, he didn't have what he needed to win or the offensive line was bad. And none of those exist. That People can paint those narratives, but they'll be false narratives. Everything's in place for him to be successful. So now that's up to him. The Elijah Moore one, though, I think that hasn't been talked about near enough because as soon as Judy got hired, everyone mentally went to, well, that means Coop won't be here past next year, which I see as false. I fully expect him to to rework his deal, sign a small extension before the season. I think that's going to happen. But Elijah Moore, who was last year the guy who was brought in to kind of audition to be that number two, and it didn't go as planned, now there's pressure on him. And I'm excited for what he can do. I'm excited to see what he can do on the outside. 
he can really get loose on the third level. And I think that that's where his best attributes are. And I think he'll flourish in that. But he is going to see less opportunities just based on the numbers of bodies and, you know, someone like Judy coming in. So he's going to have to be more impactful with the touches that he does get. The Devin Bush one, I don't see pressure there. I think he's playing with house money. He went to the best possible situation. You look what he has in front of him. They're going to be able to keep him clean. Also, kind of like more, he's not going to have a ton of snaps, but he's going to have, to, he's going to have opportunities to be impactful. And if he's just able to do that, he's going to set himself up for a big contract. So I really don't see a, a hot seat situation for Devin Bush. Yeah, Moore and Bush, you would figure they will put them in. Their snaps may decline, but their ability to impact the game will improve because you're only – it's not like you're going to ask them to be out there and doing things they can't do. Um, Watson, they're putting everything around him. I think they're going to remake the offense to tailor it to him. So I'm with you. It, it, he needs to play better. He needs to play like the guy everybody believes he was when they went out and traded for him. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, you can say you don't hear the outside noise, but he, that, that's surrounding him. That, that's the news. And that's not just our perception. We spend every day following the team. That's nationally. That's, everything's in place. You know, people wouldn't be calling this a top 10 roster, you know, just if, if it was just based on Watson. That's without Watson. So he's just stepping into that. And if he can't make that go, there's going to be doubt that he can make any team go. Casey Kinnaman, Doug Pound Daily, and the Barking Browns podcast and I are going to step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, we'll head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Also a look at uh, the wide receiver contracts. We'll take a look at the highest average annual value for wide receivers in the NFL. Where do the Browns' top two receivers rank? We'll tell you when we come back on Sports for CLE. Stay with us. All right, everybody, let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery. Like the $5.25X, it's a nice way to nab up to 150 grand. The Lady Luck family of scratch-offs is the Ohio Lottery's first ever, with five price points from $1 to 20. They're an easy way to uh, break into some fun. We continue talking Browns with Casey Kinnaman from Dog Pound Daily, as well as the Barking Browns podcast. Let's head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. You know, with the addition of UConn offensive coordinator Nick Charlton, I see this as a good thing just because Nick is coming from the collegiate aspect of football, and he has, like, a lot of fresh ideas. He's young. I believe he's been a head coach, and I feel like he's going to elevate this run game with more options, read options, zone options. I just like how aligned this staff has really become. Everything is starting to add up. As always, appreciate all the voicemails. Uh, Casey, they have certainly gotten some younger. You know, Tommy Reese comes to mind. Even Andy Dickerson is, I mean, everybody's younger than Bill Callahan in the NFL, but he's younger. And there, there are elements of motion and, and the things, and, and we've talked about that at length. Let's see what they come. You know everybody's going to be heard, and they will come to a, uh, everybody's ideas will be listened to. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I don't think uh, Stefanski gets enough credit for this because we're talking about a guy coming off winning coach of the year. He could have easily said, hey, look, it's not me. You guys need to be better. What I'm doing works. But he completely stripped it down to the studs, retooled his entire coaching staff, and he's got all these diverse minds coming from different backgrounds and different modalities. You know, And we were worried on here when it was just Dorsey announced that there wasn't going to be enough motion. Well, you start to see the, the, the what they've implemented since then with Reese, with Charlton, you know, even Dickerson, who spent time with McVay. There's, it's, it's almost going to be impossible for this offense to look the same, just given all the different voices they've brought in to surround Stefanski and build this offense up. And then we're not going to know what it looks like. We're, we're going to say we do. We're going to say we're going to see some clips from training camp and be like, oh, that right there. And then maybe a preseason game and we'll see some other. But we're not really going to know until they get almost to October really what this thing's going to look like. You know, I'm, I'm excited for it. You know, Charlton in particular, you know, like he was asked himself, who he'd compare his offense to. He said the Rams. 
I don't think anybody out there is mad at hearing that. That's those right. are the def, def, the same type of things you want to see implemented here. And, and you know the other thing is is you can trace Andy Dickerson, the the new offensive line coach, back to Sean McVay and the Rams as well. And then Tommy Reese is kind of the wild card. There there are a lot of there's a lot of motion that was used with Alabama and Notre Dame. We'll find out um, how that goes. All right, highest paid wide receivers. This is AAV annual average value. This is from Spotrack. Highest is uh, Tariq Hill, $30 million. Number two is Devontae Adams. He's at $28 million. Cooper Cup is at $26.7 million. Fifteenth highest wide receiver for average annual value is Amari Cooper, uh, $20 million. Chris Godwin's at $20 million. Brandon Cooks is at $19.88. And Jerry Judy, after the extension, checks in at $19.33. Most of that after um, the upcoming 2024 season when, it's, when his is, is pretty low. So you look at that, and, and you can sustain a couple of wide receivers in that range. So it isn't like you're paying a guy, you know, $30 million And it's very interesting because I happen to agree with you, and you alluded to it last segment. They're going to find a way to continue to have Amari Cooper there for – Another year, two, three, it depends on, on what they feel his production looks like. Yeah, you can kind of look at what contracts they tweaked last offseason, and Amari wasn't among those. He's on deck. He's going to be one of those guys that comes up here in late June, early July. They're going to bring him in. They're going to rework his deal, lessen that cap number, put a small extension on it, and spread it out for void years, you know, four or five void years on the back end. And you're going to be able to maintain this, you know. And I think you might only get an extra year put on, but that gives you that leeway to the, by the time Cooper's, because Cooper's still in his prime. Like I, people kind of mistaken this. There's a lot of people that want to move off Amari of Cooper. He's still in his prime. There's no way you can move off him. I'm sure if you, if you interviewed NFL defensive backs, they would tell you he's that dude. You need to ride that out. But you've got it set up in a way now that when you do transition away from him, if Judy's ready to take that step. But you're also not paying Judy so much that it'll handicap you from going and getting another guy when that time comes. You know, this is all part of A.B. and his magnificent cap juggling. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of Browns fans that are, you know, well, they overpaid. You can either pay ahead of the curve or after the curve. And if Judy goes out, if he does what the Browns believe he can do, they're not touching him for that average annual value. It, it would be closer to the $30 million. I'm old enough to remember David and Joku. You know, <laughs> they, this is the same exact discourse we had, and they were paying him for what he was going to do. And now no one's saying, man, David and Joku's overpaid. You know, you got in ahead of it, and he's appropriately paid, and, and if he keep, continues to develop, he'll be underpaid. You know, and that's just the way this thing goes. So they they had their eyes on Judy for so long. They had they had ideas for how they'd implement him and how they would fit him inside their contractual schemes. And they they got him. And they that's the one part of the guardrail that everyone ignores. Everyone focuses on the age, but it's identify and pay early. They got ahead of it on this, and they believe they're ahead of the game. Now time will tell. But if he gives you 800 yards and seven touchdowns, I don't think people are going to be complaining. You know, so it's it's all about how it plays out. But uh, on face value, I, I agree with getting ahead of it. Well, the flip side of it is there's no way an agent signs a contract that's extremely undervalued for what it you, what he can. You know, he, and, and Andrew Berry's done a pretty good job of finding the balance where yep. the, the agent feels like he's getting fair value, and, and Andrew Berry doesn't think it's a huge risk. You know, it's, the, it's the sweet spot, you know, and, and if you're able to strike that with the agent, you do it and you, you get make sure that ink dries and you bring it to the press and show, you know, make sure it's locked in and, and you move on from there. But he's done this with a lot of his contracts. You know, this is this is just part of the business. Uh, Judy's 24, you know, you, extremely young. You, they believe his best ball is in front of him. They believe in the upside and they're banking on it. All right. So um, this is from Corey Kinnon. Interesting. Top target getters for the Browns uh, a year ago, reallocating. How many targets do we think Judy will realistically get in 2024? He got 84 last year with the Broncos. So Njoku, 131. Cooper, 127. Moore, 101. Ford, uh, 64 out of the backfield. Tillman had 42. Bell had 29. Um, two things. I think they will pass the ball significantly more, assuming uh, that Sean Watson – is healthy. Remember, he had DTR, he had PJ Walker. 
I don't know that you were going to throw the ball 40 times. Um, you probably threw more than you wanted to with them. But they're going to throw the ball uh, a higher number of times. I would expect Judy slots in as number three behind Warren Cooper. And he might be trending towards number two. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone would be wants Njoku to see less targets or Cooper, given where they're at in their games and in their, in their development. Uh, but that's an interesting thought exercise from Corey. When I look at the receivers available and what they got last year, and I agree with you, there are going to be more opportunities, but I think that eats into more and it probably Bell. I think those are the, the two that probably go down. I think Tillman probably stays about the same. His usage probably down a little bit, but once again, just like more, I expect a bigger impact even with less opportunity just because of the way things are going to be spread around. And we talked about this, you know, le leading up to the Judy trade. They needed to find a, a true number two, someone that could slot the rest of these guys appropriately so they weren't put in these positions. So I think that that's what they've done now. So you're going to see less opportunity but more impact for those guys. But I still expect Judy to – I still expect, you know, 85 to 100 targets. You know, and I don't think that that – hopefully that doesn't come, at, uh, you know, seeing the ball in, in Joku's hands less or Amari Cooper's. Uh, but you never know how things play out. All right. So this is Jerry Judy's open score from ESPN's advanced receiver mm -hmm. ratings. Uh, this is from Ian Harfs. It's, it's meant to measure separation on a per-route basis instead of per-target basis. So last year, that's Sean Payton's offense, uh, 60, and that was 38th in the NFL the two seasons before it, 2022, he was 80. That's 11th in the NFL. 2021, 79. That's 10th in the NFL. Again, that kind of goes back to if you ask, if you give them some freedom and you aren't in a kind of antiquated offense, you didn't get open. Yeah, the, uh, the Sean Payton effect there, or maybe Russell Wilson, or maybe a combination of the two. You definitely saw him with less separation there. But just those metrics, you've you seen what he's capable of in separation. And you already got a couple separators now because Moore is a separator. I think he'll do better as a deeper threat. You know, and, and, and obviously Coop gets open. You know, that's not, not an issue. But you could see why they were banking on this. They, they, they've been high on this kid since the 2020 draft. You know, so I think they've been plotting and scheming. And they, seen a, a, they finally saw their opening, gave up very little to get him, and they believe they're ahead of the market. While nationally that might be perceived to be the same, I think if you were in the bubble in Berea, they think they got themselves a bargain with a player who is ascending. Casey Kinnaman from Doug Pound Daily, as well as the Barking Browns podcast and I can step aside, take one more time out. We'll hear from Jameis Winston and talk about the Browns' latest running back free agent signing. Sports with CLA, will be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns with Casey Kinnaman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Jameis Winston uh, met with the media today, was asked how the off-the-field issues that he's gone through um, would enable him to help Deshaun Watson uh, with those same off-the-field issues. Throughout everyone's life, they are, they are given certain uh, circumstances, conditions, and facts. Uh, but, but just because you are presented with those things doesn't mean that those things have to define you. So the the resilience and perseverance that Deshaun already possesses, uh, I, I believe that we're all going to be able to build and move forward through being the best person that we possibly can be, uh, whether that's on the field and off the field. And uh, and and I just I just know that um, some of the things that we all go through is necessary. It's necessary for our individual growth. It's necessary for us to learn so we can be able to apply a better way. Casey, um, Winston came off really well. I, I came off pretty genuine and, and, uh, and thoughtful and seems like he really wants to be here as well. 
Yeah, talking about a guy super beloved in the locker room. By all accounts, when he moves on from football, he's going to move and be a preacher. And you can hear it in his voice. I think he, yep. he has a calling for that. Uh, they're fortunate they were able to get him. And Watson is as well because, you know, we can we can judge from, from afar and uh, about what someone has done or hasn't done. But we haven't lived life under the microscope that those young men do. Watson has. So is Winston. So that that's a perfect sounding board. Someone who can really touch on what you know, what it means to persevere, what it means to grow as a person, and put something behind you and move forward and just try to be the best version of yourself day after day. So for them to be able to go get a player who can relate to Watson on that level, now and I'm sure Jameis will extend that olive branch. Whether Watson wants to embrace that, that that's up to him. But just to be able to have that afforded to him, that, that that's a huge luxury in life and. Everyone in their walk of life should be so lucky to have someone that could, could relate on that level and want to see you get to be the best best version of yourself. Yep. Again, uh, it, it it's aimed at trying to help Deshaun Watson do what they expected him to do when they traded for him. All right. Um, we had a list of free agent running backs uh, you wrote an article uh, about. Um, one of the guys that was on that list, Dante Foreman, is the guy the Browns who, in fact, will sign. You see Foreman power back 235, 14 career touchdowns, 4.2 yards per carry, 9 TDs over the last two years. Um, and, and that was when it looked like he was going to struggle. He's only 28. He'll be 28 next month, actually. And um, I did see a stat where he has got – where he has rushed 16 times in a game, he has always gained 80 yards in that game in the NFL. Consistent. Yeah, look, I'm not saying AB is an avid viewer of sports for CLE, but I'm not saying he's not. You know, I, his, our message was heard. I think we should feel good about it. And they got themselves a hammer. Someone that I, I feel fully confident, like you just said, give that man 16 carries, he's going to get 80 yards for you. That's, that is a lead back. And if you're forced to start the season without Nick Chubb, I think you're in pretty good hands. And then you feel better about the things you have backing up Foreman. You feel good. You feel better about Ford and not having to be that lead back. You feel better about Hines being able just to step in and spell for a series or, or in just in third down work and the stuff that he can do there. So I think it slots everything appropriately, and you feel better about the guy you could put out there to start the game. Yeah, and, and he had a lot of success in Carolina the year uh, – Christian McCaffrey was injured all season. He, he had, I think it was 900-some yards and nine touchdowns. All right, um, some news. Uh, the Browns will, in fact, have a local guy visiting um, them. Defensive tackle uh, Michael Hall, Jr., played high school football at Streetsboro, uh, will visit the Browns early next month. Pre-draft visits with the Vikings, Texans, Packers, and Chiefs. Um, Casey, a guy from Ohio State, a uh, little undersized but quick, so it fits kind of what Jim Schwartz likes as well. Yeah, and I also say this. Pay attention to who they bring in for their 30 visits because last year Dewan Jones was one of those guys, and we were thought it was like, why would they do that? They're not going to have a shot to draft him, and you see how it pays off. But a lot of times this is gathering intel. You know, they'll bring in someone they probably don't have an idea that they could draft, but – that might benefit two or three years down the line if they become available. You know, and Michael Hall is a, is a gap shooter, super athletic, uh, really gets really really gets vertical quickly. Uh, he'll have to work on some of his power moves. You know, he's he's that tweener. You know, being less than three hundred pounds, a defensive tackle isn't the death sentence that he used to be. Uh, but he's primarily be a pass rusher early in his career. But I, I'll tell you right now, like I, I like his game. I don't know if there's room for him the way this roster is constructed currently. But I'm definitely intrigued. And I'll be following to see where he goes. All right. So here's another one. Uh, this one just uh, as of late. Uh, Josh Edwards, CBS, Western Kentucky wide receiver Malachi Corley has his 30 visits set up. Browns, uh, also Ravens and Steelers, but Browns are one of the um, visits that Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky will be taking. Again, that's one of those wide receivers. And, and you mentioned you, you kind of look at it as a puzzle piece. That's a piece that the Browns don't have in that wide receiving core. Huge yard after catch guy that, you know, I think he calls himself the Yak King. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a piece that not many teams have, to be honest with you, that, that kind of physical receiver. And I've heard him comp to Debo Samuel several times during this draft cycle. When I watched him, I see Anquan Bolden. I mean, he's just, he's, he's violent out there. Uh, and he's someone that could, he'll probably be available in that range, you know. So th this is an interesting one for him to come in. And he, like you said, man, this there's a lot of varying skill sets in that wide receiver room. 
what he brings to the table isn't already here. So that's someone definitely to keep an eye on going forward. Yeah, I'm with you. You know what, Debo Samuel and Quan Bolden, you take both of them because both of them find a way to, to get tough yards and get into the end zone as well. Yeah, and just that physical presence. You know, it's, you know I, I know the game's changed over the years, but, uh, you know, seems fitting if you're in the AFC North to have a, a punishing receiver and uh, give those other teams the business they gave us all those years. Casey Kinneman, uh, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks for jo uh, joining us today, Casey. Appreciate it, man. Anytime, Dave. Thanks for having me. Casey Kinneman, make sure you check him out. Really good stuff. Dog Pound Daily, as well as the Barking Browns podcast. That's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLA. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLA.